January, that when the calendar turned over, it would be the 125th anniversary, I knew, thanks to one of our presenters, uh, Candy Carroll, uh, that the History Center had our, the Women's Press Health had her archives. Um, and so I realized that we should take advantage of that for our anniversary year and um, decided to put together this program. So thanks again, everybody, for coming. Um, wanted to say some thank yous, and then we'll get the program underway. Uh, thank you first to Kara Bull Trumbull and Beth Moots with the History Center, uh, John Paul Dealey and the Dear Archives, uh, and the rest of the staff of the History Center. Also, Terry and Blanchette and Candy Carter Olson for presenting. Uh, Karen Carlin for her help uh, with everything today, and the rest of the board of the Women's Press Club, which includes Cindy Lash, Connie George, Helen Fallon, uh, Kelly Gormley, and Jenny Frizzy. And last but not least, uh, Brian McCullough of Swiss Vale, who was the gentleman who donated the lovely news hen that I hope everybody got to check out over there to the left. Um, when I was doing research and after four years of being in the club, finally read the 100-page book about uh, the 100th anniversary, uh, leading up to the 100th anniversary of the club, uh, I um, was fascinated by almost everything in the book, but in particular, the news hints. And so it was really fortuitous that he happened to uh, send us an email and um, said that he found the news hen at a flea market that he collects ceramics and happens to see it there in, in Bridgeville. Uh, so we um, were able to get together and he donated the news hen to the club. The, and then once I did some research about the woman who received it, uh, her name was Marie McSwiggin. Um, anyway, she, this is what I was able to find out about her. Uh, she lived from 1907 to 1962, wrote for the Pittsburgh Press and the Pittsburgh Sun Telegraph, uh, and then did public relations uh, for several places that you can see there. Um, then uh, wrote several children's books, one of which uh, I recalled to a few of you uh, that I was able to get from the Children's Library in Oakland because uh, it's still in wide circulation today. There are 1,400 copies of it as of last year in different libraries throughout the country. It's called Snow Treasure, and it's a children's historical fiction book uh, about uh, World War II. And um, so she has several others, and one of her uh, biographies about the patron saint of Switzerland is over there as well. But um, her family also owned Kennywood. Uh, strangely enough, and she had several family members who were uh, also in the newspaper business in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, I was able to find uh, two biographies, both of which I printed out and um, put over there on the table, um, one of which said that her newspaper work helped to develop healthy respect for accuracy, good discipline, and the ability to research the subject matter. Um, and I think that's still probably true for several of our members who went on to publish books or do public relations or just about anything. I think that's what the newspaper industry kind of prepared you for. Um, and uh, I'd like her quote how she said, I like newspaper and publicity work because of the immediacy of it. So, um, that, was, uh, that was really a lot of fun to find out more about her happening to come across her news hint from 1959. <laughs> so um, our first presenter today
And her dissertation, which actually is also over to the left on the table, um, which she has graciously given us a copy of. So thank you very much, Candy. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so in addition to the dissertation that I sent to you guys, there's also the nine um, oral history interviews that I did with various members of the group. And I have given those to the archive as well, given copies of them. So if you, if you were one of the people I interviewed, your voice is now deposited in the archive. Oh, no. um, <laughs> so give me just a second, I'm going to share my screen with you here. All right, can you see my screen now? Yes? Yeah. 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 All right, awesome. So, I, you know, I love you guys. I do. I, um, uh, again, I did my dissertation on this club, and when I first found out about it, um, it was listed as the oldest women's press club in the United States. It is not actually the oldest women's press club. There is one that is six years older than you. Um, and that is the Illinois Women's Press Club. So you were the second um, longest running women's press club in the United States. Um, but I, I want you guys to know why you matter and why women's press clubs still matter today. Um, and I'm going to give you some data that I just pulled for an article that I did um, on Gertrude Gordon for Pennsylvania History, which is a journal there in Pennsylvania, um, and that will be coming out in the fall. But um, in 1995, only 17% of news subjects were women. By 2000, that had crept forward to 18%. In 2010, it was up to 24%. This is all from the, uh, from the Global Media Monitoring Project. The Global Media Monitoring Project's 2015 survey said that the rate of progress toward media gender parity has almost ground to a halt over the past five years. Still only 24% of all news subjects are women. Now you think, okay, so that there's women in newsrooms, but it's still not parity. In radio, which um, has the highest percentage of women in the newsroom, there's only 41% of newsrooms are women. In print newsrooms, it's 35%. Um, so we're looking at a problem that hasn't changed since the 1970s. So I'm a journalism professor at Utah State University now, um, going into my fourth year this year, and we're seeing about 60% of our graduates are women. Um, but they don't go on. They don't go into newsrooms. Well, why does it matter that women are in newsrooms, right? It matters because if women are in newsrooms, women's stories get told. Women are 51% of the population, and right now, only 10% of all stories are about women. And yeah, the Global Media, um, Media Monitoring Project actually says that it makes a huge difference when we're looking at um, who's doing the story. If it's a woman reporter, 14% of her subjects are likely to be women. If it's a man, 9%. Um, but it also, you know, we also need to work on what stories women are allowed to cover. So the proportion of um, female women reporters for news stories falls well below parity in all topics except science and health, where women are the equal. Only 31% of all stories on politics are written by women, and 39% of the economic news are women written by women. So women's press clubs still matter. Um, and they matter for the reasons that the women who originally organized the women's press club in Pittsburgh organized it. They organized it to, as I'm going to tell you guys, to associate with one another, to gain strength, to educate one another, and to create new spaces for women in newsroom and to get more women hired. So that is still really important today if you're looking at the numbers from the Global Media Monitoring Project, which concerned me as somebody who, yeah, I'm a historian, but I, I look at how history impacts today, and these women who started these press clubs, and they were part of a huge wave of press clubs that started in the early 1880s, um, they made a huge difference in how many women actually got jobs in newsrooms. And I have the data. 
data on that somewhere. But it, you can see it going up, it's doubling up until about World War II. So, women's press clubs matter, and I think they still matter today. This picture that you see on the first slide, I took at a, uh, at a banquet, I think it was five years ago. Um, but also, you can see women in this picture who made history. So in the front row is Paula Smith, and um, Paula, who, is she still a member of your club, guys? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Okay. So Paula is amazing, and you should have her speak sometime. She, um, she was the first woman to go into the Pittsburgh Pirates Clubhouses, and she was actually the woman who, um, whose presence pushed the league to allow women into the clubhouse. Um, and her stories are pretty gosh dang amazing. Um, so your club is full of world changers. And, um, and it wasn't even just the club, but Pittsburgh itself produced some of the most famous women journalists in history. So if you didn't know, Elizabeth Jane Cochran, otherwise known as Nellie Bly, came from Pittsburgh. And she wrote for Pittsburgh Dispatch. Um, and she, uh, when she got there, she ended up doing this expose. She um, forced her mom to travel with her to Mexico. And she did this expose on working conditions in the prisons in Mexico. And she was actually chased out of Mexico on a rail by the, um, with death threats. Um, but she came back and she wrote about it. Um, and after doing this, it made a huge difference. She also did some good exposés on working women's conditions in the factories around there. She was faced with yet another stint on society pages, writing what she just thought as fluff and gush, and she just couldn't do it. So she left this note on her um, on her editor's desk at Pittsburgh Dispatch, and he was such a mess. He didn't find it for three days. It said, "Dear QL," he was. Fight I'm off to New York. Look for your naughty kid, Nellie Fly. Um, and she eventually, as you guys know, got a job for the New York World and became one of the most famous young girl journalists. Um, even before Nellie Bly, there was Jane Gray Swiss Helm. <clears throat> and I love this quote about Jane Gray Swiss Helm, and it actually is from the archive somewhere. I don't know where. Um, I can't. Yeah, I, I can look it up for you guys later. <clears throat> but. There was somebody who was watching her drive by in a buggy there in Pittsburgh, and they looked out their window and they said, oh, there goes that horrible, awful woman who neglected her housework and wrote pieces for the press. <laughs> <laughs> she was amazing, too. She was an abolitionist um, newspaper editor, and um, her marriage was not happy. So um, in between, she started with her husband's and went through the war. She started her own paper um, and worked for several different papers. She launched, um, so she first wrote for Pittsburgh's um, abolitionist paper, The Spirit of Liberty. Then she launched her own paper, The Saturday Visitor, which was um, which was rolled in with the Commercial Gazette eventually. Um, and that's a paper that is now defunct there. And then she went to St. Cloud, Cloud, Minnesota and started the St. Cloud Visitor. And finally, she started her least um, successful paper called Reconstruction. So she was basically uh, a mover and shaker in the abolitionist news world. And finally, we have Betsy Bramall, who is also known as Elizabeth Wilkinson Wade. Now, um, some of the records mistakenly identified her, like the people doing recollections, and this is the problem with oral history, is that we have this forgetfulness. Um, that some people listed her as a founder. The actual papers of the Women's Press Club do not list her as a founder. However, she was a member of the club, and what she was was the first woman to ever be admitted to the Pittsburgh Press Club, which is the Men's Press Club. The Men's Press Club died in the 1990s, by the way, um, there in Pittsburgh. Um, and she joined the Men's Press Club in 1892. So those are just some really interesting women that I that preceded the club and that got this um, interesting stream of women's journalism coming from. Fascinating place to study if you study the history of women journalists. And by the way, you see my little note up there. Yes, I spelled Pittsburgh right. The H was not added until the turn of the 20th century, and it didn't actually become commonplace use until the 1920s. So this is a blank slide for a reason. 
because the first 50 years of the club are are really bogged down. It's a hard era to, to research because of what uh, Jamie Cord Smith calls our cultivated forgetfulness. And what this means is that the club just didn't keep good records for the first 50 years. Um, it wasn't until their 50 year anniversary that they started gathering um, all of this data and getting letters and all kinds of things. And you'll see some of that information in the um, scrapbooks there. So the era that I'm talking to you about is, is actually the era that is least um, well documented or has probably the poorest documentation of all of the club's history. Um, after that 100 year book also, so in 1991 to about now, there's also some big huge holes. So I think doing world history, interviewing people now is a really good way to keep preserving your history. Um, so the club was formed in 1891 by, um, by seven members, and they were Jamie Wilborn Ford, Virginia B. Virginie B. Hyde, Belle McElhenney, Kara Reese, who was the one who actually got everybody together, Kathleen Hussey Watson, Clara W. Walmer, and Carrie L. Weatherell. And Jamie Wilborn Ford, also known as Jamie Smith, who I, uh, Jamie Ford Smith, who's Called, got cultivated forgetfulness, was the youngest member, and she was 15 at the time. Oh. Says, oh, yes, I forgot to say that they needed me to round out the proper number of signers for the charter. Did I have to take 26 million of the last year's day? She may do with me. That would be a big day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> this club meant a lot to these women, and for good reason. Um, during the 19th century, there was a women's club movement. Um, that really, so the women's club movement started in the early 19th century, but the professional edge of it, which was the women's press club and some of the working women in the um, factories, that sort of thing, didn't get organized and start getting organized until the 1880s. And Elizabeth B. Burt, who wrote the only book that exists, that's a book length thing on women's press clubs, says it was because there just weren't any women journalists at the time to organize. So it wasn't until the 1880s when we started getting enough women to organize women's press clubs. Um, so the women's press club was, you guys were one of uh, the ones that were, that were organized around that time. I love this particular group because it was really good at teaching societal expectations for women. So I don't know how much you guys know about the Victorian expectation for white, upper middle class Protestant women, but there was this ideal that the white Protestant upper middle class woman was the moral keeper of the home. And in that way, her proper place was in the home. She had no voice in politics, she had no voice in public affairs. Well, the women's club movement changed that because women started using their proper place, free and women, to say, well, if our proper place is in morality, okay, well, then why don't we come out and we fix this particular problem? And why don't we come out and we fix this particular problem in the public sphere? Um, and then professional women's club went even further to break down that ideology that women belonged in the home by showing women doing things that were scary, blatantly, um, blatantly non-feminist. So backing up to Kara Reese here, who was the woman who organized the club originally, she was the only woman to go out and cover the Johnstown flood. Um, which killed, I can't remember how many people, but it was huge. It was in the hundreds, which at that point in time, Winston was not that well settled, so to kill hundreds of people, it was amazing. But on the other hand, these women also faced you know, societal scrutiny, and, um, and on the 50th anniversary, Rutschel, uh, Dan Bragg, the organization, 
Man said, off the record, and let's tell you that misery also belongs to the other women's club in existence. Um, and that was the Pittsburgh Women's Club, by the way. And they were more of a standard women's club, which meant that they did civil projects, they worked on the kindergarten movement, they worked on um, children's clubs, they worked on the circulating libraries, so sort of thing. Um, a group of very paid, and I imagine S T A Y E V two, which how many of you know what that means? Anybody? No. So pay much talk to me. Yeah, so that would be pulling in your stays and wearing your nice corset there. <laughs> very paid, very, very respectable lady who felt called upon to discuss in second session the question of whether Miss Lucy morals were all they should be. Because of the places she had to go to cover her story. Now I have to say though, um, the kinds of things that uh, Kara Reese covered were really amazing. He went into schools in Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and across the country, and she uncovered horrific safety violations. In one Pittsburgh school, she found that in uh, safety evacuations, so they were doing a drill like we do for fire drills in our school these days, or you know, all kinds of other things. Um, that the kindergartners in the basement had to be thrown up and out the window because they couldn't get up the stairs. <laughs> um, and so that was journalism that made a difference. And so she was known as one of the leading female muckrakers in the United States, specifically for that series, which, by the way, she published in Good Housekeeping. Good Housekeeping is still on around for as well. But it was also this great place for educating and for competing with the other women. So going back to Jane Ford Smith, who was this really fun woman, which, by the way, Jane Ford Smith, 15, when she was uh, when she was inducted into the press club, the one rule for being a member of the press club is that you had to be paid for your work. So you have to have been published and be paid. Well, Jane Ford Smith was paid $1 year of her age, which, there you go. How many of you would like to be paid one year for every year of her age? Um, so she said, you know, we newspaper women love to scoop from another in our daily work. Not to have a scoop once or twice a week was not playing the game. So, you know, part of the club was this social idea around the quote-unquote game, and I think I don't know how many of us journalists still think of it as games, but I know that we still have that idea of competition. But that's what made it fun for them. They got together, we could get up in each other's fish and say, hey, I got that scoop on you. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the scoops were fun, like Gertrude Gordon, who carries the name of your scholarship. Um, there was one story that she really wanted on Honus Wagner, who was a Pittsburgh pirate and one of the most famous baseball players in the league at that point in time. So she posted somebody outside of his house, and then she sat outside at the, the um, telephone outside the offices of her newspaper, because there was only one telephone at that point, and it was outside. Uh, and she needed her phone call to come through. And so her friend sat there stalking home his wife. And when she got home, when he got home, she got the phone call, Dropped on the table part, went over to Honus Wagner's house, asked him for an interview, and he said, No, I'm not going to give you an interview. <laughs> she said, Okay, that's all right, here. Let's walk around and look at your house. And so he took her around, showed her the chicken, showed her the cars, and started talking to her as she just asked questions, as reporters are apt to do. And the next day, this wonderful feature on Honus Wagner appeared in the newspaper. And he said, I had no idea you were doing an interview with me. <laughs> but it was accurate. <laughs> so the, there was a lot of competition and a lot of creative um, news gathering <laughs> techniques at the same time. Granted, many of these women did cover what we would think of as society pages. Now, I'm not one of those people who's down on women in society pages. I think they actually did a lot for women. 
When you see in the 1970s, when those started being taken big, we actually saw a decrease in positions for women at newspapers. So, um, and the women's pages were places where women could discuss issues like birth control, suffrage, all kinds of things. It's like this private spot in a very cold area. Um, but I, I love this new series of quotes from the women. This is from Man Bright again, and she says, the press book is no place for a sense of soul. In a group of that kind, everyone is an individualist and has no opinion of our own on every subject or voice on every opinion. It's a real test of friendship. They quietly buy, quietly for the moment at least, while your opinion is being taken to pieces or battered about, as quite frequently happens. So I think I can say, and I'll say, that the significant advantage of belonging to the press club is several advantages all rolled into one. It demonstrates the art of friendship. It develops tolerance and broadens one's own viewpoint. And it teaches respect to the other person. And, you know, as I think about our political cycle right now, which is a little depressing to me, I, I think we need more of that. I think we need to see that kind of conversation coming back. But it was really funny. So all of these things, I mean, you have to exclude the quality. They were taken in between five and eight years ago on a really crappy camera. Um, they're all from the archives. So you will see these in your scrapbooks as you're looking through. Um, and so this one, the women used to have a, um, a spoof newspaper that they put out once a year um, called The Waste Basket. And I would love to see more of The Waste Basket. There's only a couple of The Waste Baskets actually in your archive. This one, Ed Rafferty was a cartoonist. Um, and I, I love how this one talks about all of these controversial issues that the women talk about. You can see they're talking about things that are for go through the women. Politics, diet, sympathy, war, debt, sex, for peace sake. This is 1933. Inhibitions, techno uh, technology, Japan, news, travel, debt. All of these things that, you know, partially women know about and partially women are not supposed to know about. You see them really testing this idea. Well, what is a woman? What is her ability? And let us change your idea of what you think a woman's abilities are just by our existence. And then these pictures, which might be something fun for you guys to think about for your um, for your next um, banquet. The women used to do hmm, every few years they would. Every year they used to write a play about what was going on around them. And some of these plays are hilarious. Um, but they also would do reflections on the club itself. And they would dress up in different eras and then talk about what was happening in the press in Pittsburgh and in the press club itself during that era. So you can see different eras represented here. So the one on the, I don't know, which way are you guys looking? I think the one on the left with the flapper and then the suffragette. Um, that's from 1951. And uh, you can also see some cartoons of changing from their very quote unquote staid outfits with their big bustles to the flapper smoking, which would have been for, uh, forbidden for women as well. And then,
It is a club boast that it has the tune within itself to get up something in that line. So again, so this is uh, writing, the um, performances every year. women together and they taught women and they encouraged 
equipment. Um, it's some of the most formative ways possible. It was a mentorship program. Um, at the same time as it was a friendship club, and it was uh, it was a college all rolled into one. And the club itself brought in some of the most famous women in history, including a stage actress named Lillian Russell, who you see on the cover of your 100th anniversary book, actually. Um, she was considered the most beautiful woman of the era, but she also married the publisher of Pittsburgh Theater and wrote this nationally syndicated column. Well, in 1917, it was coming up on a time when women journalists were struggling for income and they were having a hard time making it. So the club itself started an emergency fund to help women who needed help with their bills or to buy some food or to get to the next paycheck. Lillian Russell organized, and you're gonna see the program in the scrapbooks, organized an event that raised $2,000 for this uh, fund where she brought in her friends from the world of stage and screen to raise money just to help women journalists. So this club did uplift its sisters. It did turn their, their eyes to the stars and taught them to steer their writing. It taught them not to trick. It taught them how to push a story forward. It taught them to keep their eyes on the prize of full-time journalism. So here's to another 25, 125 years, guys. Um, I think you guys matter. And I think that um, in particular today, we need to remember that um, gender parity in media is stagnating. So if you're wondering why you're still a member, if you're wondering why you're here, that's why you're here, and that's why the club has always existed, right? Um, you've had fantastic women throughout the year. You've had a woman in World War II who's one of the lead propagandists in, um, in Japan. You had Gertrude Gordon who walked into a lion's den, as you can you see her, um, her cartoon here on her 1952 birthday. Um, but she walked into a lion's den and sat down and had lunch with them. She floated across to Allegheny County in a hot air balloon. Um, you had Bessie Bramble, who got people's attention for all kinds of stories. You had Lillian Russell, who was one of the lead suffrage uh, jets at the time, um, and who actually thought about running for office. So, I think you guys matter. And you know, as much as you should look at history, just to remember that you mattered once, you should look to now and see you still matter today. So there you go. Born in 1880, 
Uh, so he predates your club. Uh, he was three years old. <laughs> so he probably didn't know he was going to be a member eventually. Um, and actually, he was actually born in, um, in Manila, Indiana. So I'm going to show you some information about. There we go. Um, so his early years. Anybody been to Manila? Uh, <laughs> Isn't that weird? Um, and there's a reason for that, because that's Manila, right there. It's it's right between um, uh, two major cities in southeastern Indiana. So most people haven't been there. Manila is just really that little. Um, and these are just some pictures from Manila that I wanted to share with you, just kind of give you an idea. Those are from the time period that Sai uh, lived there and his family there. He didn't live there very long, though. And um, he actually um, ended up going to Parkinburg. His family moved there. So in 1890, when they moved there from Indiana to Parkinburg, right now we could do that trip in, you know, pretty pretty quick time, right? It would have been about 11 days if they did by horse, uh, which is likely how they did it. Otherwise, uh, it would have been about three or four days by train because they would have had to kind of come up and then come down and so forth. Um, so Sai Sai was just along for the ride literally at that point um, in 1890. Um, this lovely Parkinburg. Y'all been to Parkinburg? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, what was happening in Parkersburg at the time, and, and most people, this is kind of a great thing about history. When you go back and you, and you find a history about a place, you realize that Parkersburg used to be like this incredible busy port uh, city. It was, it was a, a place for industry. Um, it was actually really big on um, standard oil. Okay, they had oil pumps there, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, they imported and exported oil. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so that's why the size family went there. They said, hey, let's leave. Um, Manila, let's go hang out at some really hot place like Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia. So they did. Um, the picture on the right there is actually uh, one of the places they lived in. It was called the Savage Flats. Um, what a fabulous place to live. Savage Flats. Um, it, his family wasn't wealthy, clearly. Um, his parents were both from farm families, which is why they were in Manila in the first place. Um, they both had very prosperous family, farm families. But really, they, the two of them were the next generation or two generations out from wanting to be on the farm still, right? So, and it reminds me, my own parents were the same way. They said, it's not the farm, we're leaving. Um, so they live in a big city. Um, that's a little school right there that was uh, right across the street from Savage Flats where um, Sai ended up going to elementary school. And that was his high school, Parkersburg. Don't you wish they made high schools look like that again? <laughs> Isn't that just I love that one. It's probably an apartment building now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, it's gone. Um, the the Parkersburg High School, this is a second iteration, the third iteration is still there, but it's, it, yeah, this was one in between and it was gone. Um, and that is uh, Parkersburg Sentinel's office. Um, great looking thing. That was literally right around the 1902, something like that. So um, not a big place, but um, this is where Sai's history in cartooning started. He was an editorial cartoonist, and, and he was actually initially, when he started in Parkersburg, he was also a reporter. Um, he got the um, red light district. Um, <laughs> yeah, which you think for a young yeah, man that was a pretty good deal. Um, but um, he also, but when he was first moved there, he actually was a newspaper carrier. And then he said he liked to draw. And they said, well, we don't have money to pay for cartoons. He said, great, tell you what, I'm going to learn the process of chocolate uh, printing for imagery. Um, and this is, we're talking a little kid here. You know, by the time he started doing it, he was about nine. He said, I'm going to teach myself. So he went to school in the day. He actually then went um, in the evenings to um, deliver the paper <clears throat> in the afternoon. And then he ended up staying late into the evening to do his own chocolates. And chocolating, by the way, just it, it, it's horrible. It's chemicals, and he burned his fingers. He had permanent scars on his fingers as a result. But he got his cartoons published. His first one being published when he was only Okay, so he's a really <coughs> amazing guy. Um, so, um, so there's a little story that goes along with that. I'll tell you really quickly what it is. First of all, this is the first cartoon that he published in the Sentinel. This is from September 21st, 1903. Um, oftentimes you see this and people say, oh, that was his first Pittsburgh cartoon. Eh, he was drawing much better by the time he showed up in Pittsburgh, okay? The, the courthouse uh, is on the, the left side of the screen, and the reason that's there is because when he was in high school, um, he got a notice from the um, uh, the lovely district attorney uh, was office, and he said, you need to appear at the courthouse. We've got a problem. And this kid was just freaked out. But he, he went by himself, ran all the way to the courthouse, in a pretty menacing building, right? Big limestone, Victorian behemoth. 
And he went in and they said, that cartoon you did, that's liable. Um, and actually, because he put the mayor on there and he put these other things on there, um, and they, they called him on it. Now, they did this, this is a lesson, this is a life lesson they were teaching the 10 men. And I tell you what, I guarantee you, it stuck. He never did it again. Uh, and by the way, I should, I should back up because that last picture actually is um, the first time he did it. He had the mayor's name on the image, and and he had some other, yeah. So this is the one that got published. This is the official published. So 1910, family decides, well, we've already overstayed our place in Parkersburg. Let's, <laughs> let's go to the second happeningest place in, in, in West Virginia, Wheeling. I kid you not, it was on a boom. It was huge. All these booms, by the way, predated some of Pittsburgh's big, big booms, okay? So again, we're talking oil, we're talking the, the, the uh, railroad finally gets to Wheeling. Oh, everybody's like, hey, we have Wheeling up there. Um, so they, and some of the, all of a sudden these people show up, right? So 1910 to 1912, he does a stint there. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I don't know, I look at these pictures and I kind of go, hmm, I don't look terribly interesting. Um, his drawing is improving. This is actually uncredited, um, uh, most places I find it. However, he was at the paper, this is a Wheeling Register. He was at the Wheeling Register at the time, and this is pretty much his style. <coughs> you notice, by the way, chalk plate is because of that they did a lot of hashtag, right? There are a lot of, to fill in, because literally, you're drawing with a stylist, um, carving <coughs> out strips of chalk plate. All right, so we go on to Pittsburgh, and this is where things get really interesting. Now, why Pittsburgh? He's a young man, he's, a, he's sitting in Wheeling, and, and he's getting into his 20s, and he says, I need to go out on my own. Where am I gonna go? So he notices that in Pittsburgh, at the sun, their cartoons disappear, okay? He notices that there's no cartoons, so he, he hops in his car at the time, right? Makes that nice long drive up the two, um, and he, he comes in and he goes, hey, I noticed you guys uh, don't have a lot of cartoons here. And they said, yeah, our guy's retiring. And he said, yeah. um, so very tenacious, very, very go-getter. He was driven to do this. Um, this is a picture of Cy and his dog. He was, he was quite a dandy looking guy, wasn't he? Um, and then these are his drawings. And I'm gonna show you, this one right here is um, one of the first drawings. This is, this, these two items are from 1917. So you can tell his drawing uh, abilities has, has actually improved significantly, wouldn't you say? He also, when he left Wheeling, he left behind chocolate <coughs> method. That's why these are holes now. They, they finally figured out how to do pen and ink and get it to appear um, on, on newspaper print. Um, he also, oops, go back up here. He also did um, Snoodles, which is a cartoon that, uh, that he did for, uh, from 1914 to about 1924. I got tired of it because it was just a daily grind. Um, this up here is actually his very last cartoon from Pittsburgh. Um, uh, August 18th, 1977, he actually, his, his retirement was announced a week later. Um, it wasn't something that Cy saw, it was something that other people, by this time, his drawings, um, his philosophy, you can imagine, he's in his late 80s and people are going, you're not with the political correctness, we were calling it that at that point, but you know, he was saying some pretty amazing things, not out of hatred and, and not, it was just purely that's how they spoke at the time that he was active. So um, they finally had enough of the, um, the Post-Gazette finally had enough with having to deal with his imagery and, and the people, outraged people. So they went ahead and, and, and they retired the guy. So one thing I wanna show you that um, was amazing, during World War II, this was something that he was huge here. Um, he and another gentleman by the name of George Sherman uh, designed these um, posters for World War II. Um, the really cool part about it is I thought they were lost forever. Uh, turns out his grandson has 24 of the 32 posters. So you guys are seeing them for the first time anywhere ever. Um, well, since 1941, <coughs> 1944. Um, but this was a this was actually sanctioned by the FBI, this effort. So he was huge. He was, he was not just a Pittsburgh, or like a well-known Pittsburgh, he was that. He was known by presidents. He was known, he appears in presidential libraries, um, well, not, uh, not Teddy, but um, shortly after Teddy, Theodore Roosevelt, all the way up through uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, Ronald Reagan. So his stuff, he was still putting out, and his president, 
is less than some advanced request materials. So it's out there. Uh, but these, like I said, they just appeared finally, and so they're going to get published. I'm very excited about this. I'll let them just show you because they're actually pretty. He usually doesn't do drawings in color, so these are very, very rare. These are really, really rare. So, why am I here? Well, Sai, as I said, honorary member. So I'd like to share with you some of the items here. Um, that he did drawings, obviously. He did a lot of drawings for uh, fundraisers for your club. Um, if your fundraiser, uh, if your club had a big fundraiser, a big dinner, uh, something like that, you'd actually do a lot of the drawings for the club itself. Um, this is something I'm hoping to someday find. You see what it is? He actually drew a version of your news hen. Um, and I'm hoping that it surfaces to keep your eyes peeled, okay? Because it, it would be this drawing here that he did, um, and, and, he, and it was used in this poster for um, a particular event in 1960. So it'd be great if you guys, and if you do find it, tell John right away, okay? He, and then he'll call you <coughs> right away. <laughs> um, so he also did things like, um, well, you guys honored him, certainly, like I said, by making him an honorary member. But he also did things like, yeah, up here, did, did chalk talks. He would actually have a big chalkboard and he would do all these drawings um, and talk about things. Um, talk about the history that's going on, the history and the current events and do all chalk, um, chalk talks. And so he did that a lot for your club. He also did Santa, he played Santa. And um, this is a great Santa, I'll show you. You can see by his little face here, he's a bit of fat. <laughs> yeah, you throw a little hat on that guy, a little beard, and he got him. <laughs> he had that personality too, very twinkly. Now this, I just wanted, I threw that in because I thought that was amazing. Sai is great. Jerry <laughs> Grant, are you kidding me? Who would not have gone, I would have gone to that dinner. I mean, I, I, uh, I spilled my heart. Okay, but anyway, so I was like, yeah, all these movies they're filming in Pittsburgh. Go we'll get somebody yes, on these yeah, days. Helen just said that's in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that is his quest. Who are you? I love Terry Grant. Oh, he is just one amazing gosh. I wanted to share this right here. This was actually uh, an obituary uh, that was put together. The reason I wanted to share this is because it, it has all of the stuff that he did. Um, and since he's committed to this exclusive honorary group of, of famous women writers, because of his many favors for the club over the years, frequently he would turn his quixotic talents um, over to the creation of delightful cartoons highlighting special club events. At Christmas time, he would perform at Santa Claus, dispersing, uh, dispensing gifts uh, to club members with pixie-like glee that was his <coughs> trademark. And actually, at the very bottom, it says, to side fan the club, his passing seems to bring it close to a special, warm, and human era in the newspaper world. Oh, wow. One of the best obituaries I've read. Um, is, is this one on side. Everybody else was like, oh, he was a... But, but they get to his his heart, the heart of him. He really was uh, one of those people that, you know, you ever had that thing where uh, if you could invite anybody from the past history to have dinner with you, who would it be? He would be on my list. This man's got stories like crazy. And I can't get into him today, but I'm in. We'll, we'll share them all. Um, this is a great picture I have to find in 1927. <coughs> Uh, on the left, and then this on the right is actually uh, what he looked like pretty close to his retirement in 1977. Um, he started, I should say 1927 is important because that's when the post is said, um, you know, was formed. And he actually was hired by um, Paul Block Sr. Um, directly. And he actually, Paul Block <coughs> Sr.'s son, Paul Block Jr., actually had um, two boys, um, had several children, but one of them he named um, Cyrus um, Paul Block. So, Cy was that close with the Blocks. Um, you know, politics aside, people's opinions aside, the <coughs> names were so good to him for his many, many years. And in fact, um, uh, Bill Block did not want to have Cy leave. I mean, to have Cy still staying there when he's well into his 80s, working and doing his job, um, he knew that if he was let go, he would he would die. And in fact, um, within um, well, in 1983, so uh, not too long after, um, he was retired about six years and he, he made it. His wife, Dorothy, uh, passed away in, in May um, 22nd, and, and then Cy actually found out about it, and um, he died uh, shortly after he found out. So 1983 was when he passed away, and it was really, it was one of those things where at the end of the story, I'm thinking, my God, I wanted to go on. Um, but this is a great shot of it. That is Cy. You know, that, he's laying back, he's got his highball glass there. And um, he is, that is his personality, and I wanted to share that image with you. And then finally, last piece. 
And so I just wanted to share with you a little bit about Size Life. Um, you can imagine it didn't take much to get a book um, about him. And so I'm hoping to, at some point, um, share the book with you. But um, I really just wanted to, to share a little bit about your, your only honorary male member. So thank you very much. Provide some context for those materials 
um, as we uh, go through the day. So the Denver Library and Archives is part of the Heinz History Center. This is the Western, um, the, the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania. We were founded in 1879. We have over 700,000 photographs, 3,500 manuscript collections, um, and uh, 600 record titles. Most importantly, we also have uh, materials in many, many different formats. And this is a sample of the types of formats that are just in your four boxes, the, the four different feet of materials that you have. So you've got correspondence and photographs and um, newsletters and membership roles, scrapbooks, charters, bylaws, minutes. These are called primary source materials. This is different than the published source materials. And uh, this is all the raw stuff that you can literally write a dozen books from, because uh, there's a lot of stuff here. We also have collections of all the Pittsburgh newspapers. And this is important because your members have been writing for these newspapers for over 125 years. And this is still the best raw source of trying to get copies of the materials that they were actually generating. The four quotes that I'd like to put up here, and this is perhaps sets the setting for the uh, club. These are individual collections, which are also part of the deputy collection of members. So for example, for Elizabeth Wade, for Betsy Bramble, uh, she copied, uh, she cut out um, all of her articles. She was primarily a theater critic, uh, and so she cut them out, placed them in the scrapbook, and we have all of her scrapbooks. So it's a nice uh -huh. collection and assemblage <laughs> of all of her materials. Uh, Jane Quisthelm, of course, was a publisher and a writer herself. Um, Eliza Knight, we have her collection, Margaret the Lamb, the novelist, short story writer, and poet. These are two quotes from Jane Quisthelm, um, and as our boys and men are all expected to be presidents, so our girls and women must all hold themselves in readiness to preside in the White House. I and mean, nobody in the world can honestly distribute more at a discount than in this capital of the government of the people. And one of the items we pulled this morning is on top of the scrapbook there. Terry was holding it up. It's titled, what's it called? It says, Women's Press Club sends first woman president to the White House. And it's February 10, 1940. 1940. Oh, wow. So oh, your materials contain this retrospective kind of idea of things that are going on today. And, and these folks were writing about this you know, 100 years ago. Um, this is another quote from James Wishelm and uh, anything written. I mean, this woman was amazing in her own time. Uh, I cannot tell what I am as much afraid of as a woman who <laughs> invariably washes on Monday. It is a kind of key to character, and if her mouth is not puckered and her brow wrinkled, they will be unless she repents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is in the first box, the second folder, and it's the uh, certificate that was given in 1898 from the General Federation of Women's Club uh, when you were founded. And um, it's not the first press club, as was already mentioned, but I will, at the end of the presentation, show you five or six other women's clubs in Pittsburgh that were being founded in the same period. Not a, not a press club, but a little bit different. This is a program uh, that was done in 1917. It was one of the bigger annual fundraiser, um, party slash theatrical kind of programs. It was, this is uh, Lillian Russell, uh, she's on the front cover of it. And this was really, um, not just a fundraiser, but if you read the program, all of the big names in Pittsburgh came and supported this. Um, Frick gave money, the Rouse gave money, Babcock gave money, um, Heinz gave money. They're all listed on the program. They all attended the event. And it, it, was, a, it was a major social uh, activity. And uh, the theater programs themselves uh, uh, run a very comprehensive uh, span of years and show some things. I pulled this just to talk a little bit about your awards. The awards program for the Women's Press Club, it was a huge program. Um, and Ann Zorowski, who wrote your 100th anniversary book, uh, this is her writing award for 1958. So uh, it's an example of the awards. Not only do we have the certificates and who got the awards, but in many cases we have the writing that they submitted uh, to get the award and the judges' comments on the writing so that the committees who were judging the various works can um, also be seen. This slide and the next slide, I only put here because they intrigue me. We collect menus uh, and cookbooks at the High History Center. <laughs> this is the 99th and the 100th anniversary dinner. They were both at the Duquesne Club, as you can see. But this uh, does not compare to the cookies that are at the back of the <laughs> They were 
stuffing, stuffed quail, stuffed <coughs> chanterelle mushrooms. And everything is in French. And it was multi courses, and there were five different wines. And it was these were these were extensive dinners. These these were major social happenings. Uh, and many uh, of and this is a, this is another one of those research areas where you can understand the evolution of Pittsburgh foodways just by looking at your menus in your programs over a space of 67 years and how that that has changed very dramatically. Um, this is a this is a, an interview that was done of one of your um, founding members, and it's a transcript of that interview. And what I did was I just put one uh, clipping from it. It's actually right in the middle, but I kind of took a little bit of context. She said that one day the editor of our hometown paper came to my house and asked me to take a position on this paper as a general reporter. The day I started out, pencil and notebook in hand to gather the news in that small city was the most fortunate day of my life, for it opened up to me a means of broad education I could have not received in any other way, newspaper work. So she was talking about the day she became a journalist, and um, the interview is just incredibly motivational to read because it gives the sense of of why this woman at the end of her life reflected back and recognized uh, the importance of, of her work. Uh, this is the cartoon that was published in uh, honor of Clyde Humberford after he died. And I thought I would just, you know, getting... You have to get put toward, uh, away from the... You have to be behind sure. the speaker. There you go. Okay. So, um, Performance only women's press club presents a conversational extravaganza entitled Get It Off Your Chest. <laughs> no stars, no future players, everyone gets into the act. Stover's Wood Street, uh, wow. Street. Wow. Stop it, yeah. um, Prologue is at 5 30, the show's at 6, and the reserve seats were $2.25. Oh. <laughs> let's, let's make that our next The dinner, even the dinners were very. This is a member from the White House, house and uh, they were writing to the president of the Women's Press Club. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your letter and kind words. Bill and I thoroughly enjoyed ourselves at the Women's Press Club, 91st anniversary dinner. It was delighted to have a chance to speak uh, uh, for that fine group, and it's the press secretary for Mrs. Reagan. So uh, these were the, the folks who attended. This, uh, Candy also used in her presentation, this was the uh, art by Ed Rafferty, it's 1933, and again, and I think Candy emphasized this, the words uh, uh, above the um, barrier, the uh, screen, uh, are 
what's going on behind it is about palmistry and sex and news and diets and movies and men <laughs> and children and oh by the way Japan and politics <laughs> and you know so it's this broad broad scope of, of things. This is another one of the theatrical uh, productions. This is as late as 82, 83. Uh, Byline Nelly Bly. By the way, if you can see all of the different pictures of people dressing up as Nelly Bly over the years, there's a whole. It, you can do a whole interpretive thing on, on images of Nelly Bly because many people interpreted uh, how Nelly uh, looked in dress. But again, there's another uh, dinner drama there with uh, big stuffed squash and um, and a fresh fruit marinade. These are two examples of the yearly wastebasket. These publications are phenomenally fascinating for social history because this was the stuff that was kind of a parody and kind of tongue in cheek and kind of never got into the major press, but it was a sharing of the club's work. And so they were writing for peers, they were writing for each other. And um, often the art, again, associated with this is phenomenal. This is uh, a caricature of a women's press club board meeting on the front cover of the one that I put over on the table. This picture was put because um, Stacy asked me to find a picture that had Maurice McQuiggan in it. And Maurice McQuiggan is a second, from, a third, from, third from the end here on the back row. But um, I actually have a list of the folks in the picture, and many of them are identified. Um, they are many of your former. Not a, by the way, not all of these are identified. Some of them are question marks, but it's. Marie McSwiggin is the third one in. Um, Helen Donnelly is next to her. Annabelle Craig, Francis Walker. Fourth from the end over here is Dorothy Connor. And in the front, Zora Yontrovich. And in uniform, Captain Bernice Chan. Yeah. So. There was an award at one point uh, named after Bernice Chan. Or was it Mary Chan? Uh, and Marie. Uh, Zora Unkovich was a past president. This is um, the Gertie Gordon that we refer to in the birthday announcement, but she flew in a balloon over Shenley Farm, and uh, that's her. And uh, this is a picture of Gracie Druitt Lattice, and an award was given in her memory by her daughter since 1971. So that's another uh, a picture of a former person who the award was named after. Okay, and I wanted to put some context into this. These are other women's clubs in our collection from the same period. So the Aurora Reading Club was founded in 1894, which is an African-American reading club. We have their records. The Noetic Club was founded in 1896. The Epic Club was founded in 1898. So we are rich with a number of other women's clubs, and um, your club's records are within the context of, of other women's movements. I think it's handy records. Uh, for clubs. And this is the Women's Club of Pittsburgh, which was founded in 1875, and we have their records as well. So, um, understanding the relationship and cross membership of these clubs is a whole other dissertation, so that would be very cool for mm -hmm. to come to do. Do they this, still exist? Yeah, they still, they, they still exist. And uh, this, this is uh, something in doing research for this the National uh, Women's History Museum has a web page. This is the URL, and you have this now on your computer, right? So you can share this with your members. But this is uh, Women with a Deadline, uh, Female Printers, Publishers, and Journalism from the Colonial Period of World War I. And this is online. And this is kind of now where I can start doing my pitch. I would love to do a website on Pittsburgh's Women's in Journalism. You guys have the records that would make this possible. A web exhibit would be really easy to pull together, but you'd have this it yourself and decide what story you wanted to tell. But there's a model here that would be great, which works works me up to my big pitch is we need to update the archives. We have everything really lovely since uh, 1991, and then in 1991 it kind of sort of stops. So we have 25 years worth of archives that we need you guys to kind of sort of come through and collect for us, choose the content for a web exhibit, and then update the finding aid. I do have copies of the finding aid here with me. When we finish our uh, presentations here this morning, I'll box this up, I'll roll it behind the reference desk if you're in the building for the rest of the day. Mary and Megan are up there, they'll be happy to allow you to 
um, go through the collection a box at a time, and uh, that's it. I wanted to end with a quote from Margaret Deland, a um, Pittsburgh novelist. As soon as you feel too old to do a thing, do it. But thank you very much for coming today. We appreciate that. Thank you. 